Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. This is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awake or awakening people. Um, if you'd like to support our efforts uh, or to investigate all the other interviews that we have archived, please visit batgap.com. That's B-A-T-G-A-P. My guest today is Stephen Bodian. Uh, I'll just read a little short bio of him here. Stephen offers satsangs, intensives, and retreats in the tradition of his teachers, Jean Klein and Adyashanti. His gatherings are noted for their humor, warmth, spontaneity, and intimacy, and combine direct pointers, lively dialogues, silent sitting, and guided self-inquiry. He is the author, author of several books, including Wake Up Now, A Guide to the Journey of Spiritual Awakening, and Beyond Mindfulness, The Direct Approach to Lasting Peace, Happiness, and Love. And um, I completed the second one this week, and I got pretty far into Wake Up Now, and I really enjoyed them both. I, they're keepers for me. Um, Stephen spent a decade practicing Zen intensively as a monk, but left the monastery because he sensed that the rigorous practice of meditation was obscuring the truth he was seeking. After studying Zogzhen, I pr probably pronounced that wrong, for several years, he met his guru, Jean Klein, a European teacher of Advaita Vedanta, who told him to stop meditating and instead discover the meditator. Shortly after he met Jean, he had a profound awakening to his true identity as timeless presence. After Jean's death, Stephen met Adyashanti, and in 2001, Adya gave him Dharma transmission and invited him to teach. Stephen is the founder and director of the School of Awakening, an annual eight-month awakening intensive, and he leads regular retreats and shorter intensives in Tucson and at the Garrison Institute in New York. Trained and licensed as a psychotherapist, Stephen offers individual spiritual counseling and mentoring sessions to people throughout the world. His approach blends direct, experiential, non-dual wisdom with the insights of Western psychology to support students in realizing who they really are while inquiring into the stories and patterns of thinking and behaving that continue to cause <laughs> suffering. And I first heard of you, Stephen, when you were the editor of the Yoga Journal way back. Oh, wow. Yeah. A long time ago. I remember your name from that. Oh, yeah. very good. Yeah, that's a yeah. long time ago. <laughs> yeah. 20 years now, Rick. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> been on this trip for a while, you know? Yeah, we have, haven't we? Yeah. As the Grateful Dead said, what a long, strange trip it's been. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think the reason I enjoyed your book so much, and I'm, I'm still enjoying the one I'm still in the middle of, is that, you know, you're definitely speaking from experience. I, I, I found a lot of little subtle bones to pick with you as I went along, um, but nothing I would utterly disagree with, and probably nothing you would utterly disagree with, because you tend to have a comprehensive perspective on things. You take paradox into account. You know, you're able to say, yeah, this is true, but now this polar opposite thing here is also true. It just, you know, there's a larger truth that engulfs or encompasses them both. So maybe that's a good starting point for our discussion. Oh, uh, okay. You have yeah. a question? That's, that's kind of, well, that's, <laughs> that's just a sort of a catalyst to get you going there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, because uh, who we really are contains everything. Mm -hmm. There is nothing left out. I mean, what does non-dual mean except uh, all-inclusive, right? Yeah. So embracing everything, this and that, not this or that, right? Um, that is the understanding that, that we come to. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the full embrace of life as it's unfolding. Um, it's not about achieving some special state, uh, you know, apart from what's right here, you know? Yeah, and what's right here is pretty special if you can really appreciate it, wouldn't you say? That's right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's both special and ordinary. Again, the paradox, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, and of course, you know, perspectives vary drastically from person to person, from species to species. I mean, the very same scene can be perceived with a completely different appreciation or lack of it, according to one's ability to appreciate. All right. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, someone posted a critique recently of a, an, or an interview I did in which he, he, he was emphasizing that there are no levels of enlightenment. Either you're enlightened or you're not. And um, I tend to feel, just from everything I've observed and experienced so far, that, well, ultimately that may be true. There are many degrees of awakening, many degrees of, of deepening into uh, an appreciation of what is. Uh, would you agree with that? 
Yes, I would agree with that. There's only one truth, right? And Ultimately. when we, yeah, when we see that truth, that's awakening, right? Mm -hmm. But the degree to which we actually live that and live from that from moment to moment, I think that's what differs, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's one thing to see it when you're just sitting quietly to know who you are and rest in that, but how much do you actually come from that moment after moment? You know, how much does that infuse your life uh, and infuse everything you do, you know? Yeah. I, it's not some encapsulated something that we return to and, oh, this is very nice, my little awakening here. <laughs> it's something that lights up your life, right? Otherwise, it's not, uh, it's not awakening. Yeah. And it seems to me that that leads right into a point that you talk about a lot, which is the direct path versus the progressive path. Um, right. You know, one can directly and immediately have a, a glimpse or a taste of your true, one's true nature, but isn't there necessarily always a progression in terms of how much that gets integrated into your daily life and, and experienced in a sort of an abiding way as opposed to being some nice glimpse you had? Yeah, no, I totally agree. You see, the progressive approaches that I critique particularly in my book, Beyond Mindfulness, are those that uh, are gradually getting through, through different stages and levels to finally achieve something that's uh, attainable in some distant future, mm -hmm. right? The problem with that is it uh, uh, kind of obscures what's always already present, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the approach that I offer and is offered in the traditions of Zen, Dzogchen, is a direct pointing to the uh, truth of who we really are, which is always already here, present, awake. It's our natural state. And then once you realize that, then there's a progressive path of deepening into that and abiding as that, living that from moment to moment. So uh, it's not so much progression toward something, it's actually an unfolding of what's been realized. So it's a different understanding of what uh, progression is, you know? Yeah. So maybe to, to dwell on that point for a bit, um, you're, you might be distinguishing between progressive, progressing towards something which you've never experienced before and which you think is going to be really great when you experience it and you're really striving with all your might to get to it, between that and you know, having a taste of that from day one and then you know, enriching and deepening and clarifying and stabilizing that taste as you go along. Exactly. Um, Dogen, the great Zen master Dogen said, to take the backward step that turns your light inwardly to illuminate the self. Mm -hmm. So it's the, the backward step, it's not the outward step, you know? Yeah. And too many traditions like mindfulness, which I critique in the book, are very much about developing, you know, certain qualities and stages. And what happens there is you are um, lost in a kind of endless progression mm. and particularly lost in this kind of sense of being this separate someone who's meditating mm -hmm. and and developing this spiritual skill this right. kind of spiritual spiritual resume which just creates more spiritual ego you know it's another form of ego mm -hmm. and somehow you have to cut through that at a certain point and i think what happens is when you progress on the path of let's say mindfulness or some other progressive path you build up a spiritual ego it just it creates more that you have to cut through in a certain way Mm. So the point is to cut through from the very beginning, just to cut through to the essence, and once that's realized, then to uh, to foster the unfolding. Yeah. yeah, that's very good. That was actually my experience from the, the day I learned to meditate. There was an initial glimpse of, in 1968, initial glimpse of true nature, I would say, and then it's yep. just been a matter of clarification and you know, remove, you know, along cleaning the windows of perception, to quote William Blake, as you do in your book, as time has gone on. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My experience was different. My experience was, you know, constantly striving on the progressive path for years and years and years mm -hmm. as a Zen monk. And then having my teacher, Jean Klein, say to me, you know, stop looking, you know, find the meditator. That's what cut through it. But I had all those 10 years before, which is why I appreciate <laughs> people being stuck in the progressive approach and yeah. why I write, write about it. It was my experience. Yeah. I think I went to that same little Zen center in Midtown Manhattan that you mentioned in your book, and, and this was like in the fall of 68. I went in there and had a little session with the guy and some other people who had shown up, and uh, but then I ended up kind of moving on to a different direction, but um, it was kind of funny. Ah. It was like one of those small world experiences where you mentioned that, right. that little Zen center. 
Um, yeah. What you said about Dogen reminded me of that verse in the Gita where it refers to re withdrawing one's senses from their objects like a tortoise withdrawing its limbs. So there's definitely a kind of an inwardness Im implied there as opposed to it always seemed to me when I read about mindfulness and such practices that, that they almost automatically directed you outward in a way because they engaged you in a task that you had to keep hammering away at, you know? Yeah, that is one of the, the problems. I mean, I think ultimately the point is to return the awareness to the meditator, to that which is meditating, to awareness itself. But it's such a long road to get there when in fact you merely need to take that backward step right now. Yeah. In, the, in this moment, uh, it doesn't require years of cultivation of some mindful state, which then becomes just a state, again, that you have to cut through. Mm. Right? Yeah. One thing you mentioned in one of your books is uh, that nobody really wrote anything down for about 500 years after the Buddha died. And, you know, it made me wonder, and, and you, you wonder in your book, whether what is being taught and has been taught in his name actually bears very close resemblance to what he actually taught. Yeah. And, and you wonder whether he really did teach mindfulness at all or, or, you know, something entirely different that over the course of centuries got garbled. Well, if you look at the Buddha's life, he didn't practice mindfulness, actually. He had a, a succession of teachers who were teaching different kinds of yoga. Mm -hmm. And then he finally said, look, I'm done with this. I'm done with the asceticism. I'm going to sit down on this seat and uh, I won't get up again until I see my true nature, until I finish the job, right? He sat down. He actually had a nice meal, which he hadn't had in a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, he sat down and then after a time of meditating, he woke up. He never practiced mindfulness. So uh, I even questioned the foundation of you know, mindfulness practice in the Buddhist teachings. Mm. Uh, as you say, we don't know what the Buddha taught, and the point is not to follow the Buddha, the point is to become the Buddha. Mm -hmm. right. As the Buddha himself probably would have emphasized. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Work out your own salvation with diligence, mm. is what the, what the Buddha said. Yeah. One thing that comes to mind in this discussion of mindfulness, and as I was reading your book, I was thinking about, is that I, I see a, a phenomenon where people take the symptoms of something and then try to use those as a path. In other words, it's like they take a, a description as a prescription. So, you know, in an awakened state, one tends to be very mindful quite spontaneously, right? Quite naturally. And right. so that would, you could say, as a symptom of you know, an awakened state. So it's, it's like people are saying, all right, well, let's try to mimic these symptoms. Let's try to impose these symptoms upon ourselves in the hope that we will arrive at the awakened state, but it seems to me it could be a cart before the horse kind of situation. Yeah, I agree. In fact, a lot of the, let's say the uh, Vipassana, the mindfulness tradition, a, a lot of emphasis on cultivating different qualities and mind states, which are actually the qualities and mind states of the awakened person. Mm. But rather than cultivate them, which I think is just, as they say in Zen, adding another head on top of your own, it's really about discovering the innate compassion, generosity, love uh, that are inherent in you already, you see, re revealing those. So it's not about creating something else, something different, right? Uh, mindfulness, I like to think of it as presence, really. Yeah. Mindfulness, mindfulness, of course, has the, the word mind in it, and it suggests something laborious, as you suggested, something you have to keep doing. Uh, presence is, again, our natural state. You don't have to do presence. You simply have to fall into presence. Yeah. Which we can talk about because that may be, in a way, I mean, as effortless as that can be, it can also be frustrating for people when they hear an instruction like that because they say, well, how do I fall into presence? I don't seem to be falling in. You know, there's all these distractions and, you know, and right. I keep, you know, my mind is, is turbulent. And obviously you couldn't say, to take an extreme example, you, you wouldn't get very far if you said that to someone who was psychotic in a, in a psychiatric hospital or something like that. They might need a certain amount of other things before that could be an instruction that would have any potency yeah. for them, don't you think? I, I agree. And in fact, I, well, I have to admit my little secret is that I teach mindfulness to many people uh -huh. as a very helpful tool. 
uh, but with a different understanding. I mean, mindfulness, being present for your experience, being present for the breath, can be wonderful and, and uh, can help uh, bring the attention into the present moment from past and future and allow you to discover the innate presence that's all, always already there. Mm -hmm. So I teach it, but with a, a different end, right? With it embedded in a different set of teachings. But the actual pra practice of being present, which is really all mindfulness is, uh, is a beautiful practice. And uh, you know, I highly recommend it. <laughs> Just don't get stuck there. Yeah. That's, that's the key, don't get stuck there. And I suspect from reading your book with your emphasis on um, effortlessness that when you do teach mindfulness, you teach it in such a way that people don't end up straining and struggling and, you know, uh, causing stress right. for themselves, but that you somehow right. teach it in a way that is more natural and effortless? Well, the way I teach it uh, primarily is simply to sit down and be open to what is. Mm -hmm. That's it. I mean, that's the essence of the instruction. Be open to what is. In the Tibetan tradition, they talk about, and I often talk about, sky-like mind, the sky-like quality of mind. Mind which is open like the sky and includes everything. So if you can sit and simply open to what is, just the way it is, then that's all the instruction you need. If that's not sufficient, then you can begin with being aware of your breath, and then expand to being aware of sensations, and then let go of any boundary whatsoever and simply be open. So that's a kind of doorway, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a, a portal into presence, right? But the simple instruction, the essence of the instruction is to simply open to what is, because openness, again, is our natural state, yeah. you know? And eventually, if you just practice openness, so-called practice openness, you discover the openness that's already there. So when you teach this to groups of people, what percentage would you say actually are able to just sit and be open to what is? And what percentage say to you, hey, you know, I, I sit here, but I'm thinking about what, you know, this and that and the other thing, past and future, and I'm hungry and I'm itchy and, you know, I'm tired, I'm sleepy. And, you know, their, their mind just keeps turbulent uh, activity, which is customary for them. Uh, what right. are you, what, what's your batting average in, in terms of a group of people? <laughs> <laughs> I've never, I've never toted up my batting average, but <laughs> what, what I find is in retreats and intensives, people seem to get it very quickly. Yes. Mo mo most people, because there's a quality in, in the group energy that really supports that letting go mm -hmm. and opening, right? Uh, when they go home, then then the question arises: How do I return to that? Right, right. and that's what I do when I work with people. And and again, I may uh, recommend some kind of mindfulness, some yeah. kind of being present for experience, because the whole point of being aware, let's not call it mindful, but being aware of objects, is that ultimately the objects are pointers back to the ultimate subject, right? so that you come to rest back as awareness, right? But first of all, there's awareness of objects, and then eventually you allow the objects to point you back to rest as the ultimate subject. Mm -hmm. And when you say objects here, give us an example. Tree, rock, car, sky, objects. Okay. Objects of awareness. So how does a tree point you back to the ultimate subject? Well, if you sit quietly, and uh, you, let's say you're looking at a tree, mm -hmm. right? Then eventually your ideas about the tree fall away, your words about the tree fall away, and um, eventually there's only the tree. You know, there's simply presence, uh, undivided presence. You know. That's the invitation mm. to discover the undivided, you could say. Right? But again, that doesn't necessarily happen automatically, right? No. And, and, you know, and most meditative practices advocate having the eyes closed because the, if the eyes are open, the attention is drawn outward to, you know, physical objects and so on. And whereas with the eyes closed, it has the possibility of getting more subtle and settled. Um, so I guess when you teach mindfulness, do you advocate, you know, having the eyes closed so you can go more easily within or, or what? Initially, I, I recommend the uh, eyes closed, mm -hmm. but in the Zen tradition, you know, which I spent most of my years, 
the eyes were open, actually. Yeah, but um, you're staring at a wall, right? Yeah, you <laughs> staring at a wall or the floor, well, something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not a whole you, don't, you, you don't actually stare at the wall. Yeah, you stare at the, at the floor. Okay. But still, your your eyes are open, yeah. so you're not cutting off the yeah. connection with the outside, which is a slightly different mm -hmm. approach. But uh, I think for developing presence uh, awareness, I think eyes closed is great. But then eventually, of course, you open your eyes. You're walking out in the world, right? And uh, I think that's when it can actually go deeper in the sense of seeing beyond the duality of subject and object. I think that's even harder in a way when your eyes are closed because you're just dwelling in the subject, right? When you open your eyes, then there's these objects. How do you negotiate life in the so-called objective world? You know, how do you bring that knowing that you've experienced with your eyes closed into being with objects? Mm -hmm. right? That's when the non-dual really reveals itself. Yeah. Do you take into account in your teaching um, the physiology? Like, you know, these days neuroplasticity is a popular term and, and they say right. that, that long-term meditators are actually sculpting their brains and that you know, ex <laughs> examining the brains with MRIs and stuff, you actually see significant differences in the brains of people who've um, done, a, done a lot of spiritual practice. Very and, familiar. Yeah, yeah, and then in the whole Eastern world, you have all the ideas of vasanas and kleshas and samskaras and, you know, all this, and, and then subtle physiology, things like the chakras, and, and, all, and the understanding is always that there has to be a, a lot of transformation on, among, on all those subtle and gross levels of the physiology to really support and sustain uh, an enlightened state of awareness and that you can't just take somebody who's been a meth addict for 10 years and expect them to pop into enlightenment or the, the chances are very slim anyway. So what would you say about all that? Well, for example, Hatha Yoga was originally intended as a way to develop the body uh, and the, the uh, energy centers for the uh, awakening of Kundalini. That was the original purpose of Hatha Yoga. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I think uh, once I think it's possible to awaken without preparation, if that's what you're asking, uh, definitely. Uh, it can be unsettling, uh, for sure. Uh, you know, it took me a long time to settle down after my awakening. Well, you had preparation. But, uh, uh, and I had preparation. I mean, I've that's interviewed right. people who weren't even interested in any of this stuff and had a sudden awakening that re really took a while to settle down from. Absolutely. Yeah. And I worked, with, I worked with people like that. Mm -hmm. And, of course, what it often does is it'll uh, activate... Uh, uh, centers or uh, contractions, uh, you know, feeling tone complexes, whatever you call them, in the body that uh, are energized, and then it seems like there's more suffering after you awaken. It can be. Um, more confusion, um, more uh, pain, more emotionality, right? Mm -hmm. How do you work with that? Which is one of the reasons why I went back to school to study psychology, why I bring that into my work with people, because people who awaken. Uh, often are uh, dealing with these kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. So to put it in other terms, would, would you say that a certain amount of internal house cleaning can be conducive to awakening? Uh, and but if you haven't done that house cleaning, or even if you have, then after awakening, uh, there's necessary the, the awakening itself provides a kind of a, a fuel for for house cleaning, it demands it at that point. You say, okay, you're going to be in this awakened awareness, well, we've got to clean things up a little bit here. And you can really go through a lot of turmoil as, as all kinds of buried stuff is, it comes up and gets resolved. I think that's uh, very true. And I think that's often discounted or minimized among teachers of awakening, that it's not really often so widely recognized. Mm -hmm. The importance of the work post-awakening or pre-awakening I mean, I have to say, in terms of uh, pre-awakening, you said I had a lot of preparation. Uh, I actually don't think that uh, my zazen, my years of zazen, actually prepared me very well. In fact, it was my, uh, while I was meditating, uh, that I started having a lot of turmoil coming up, that my teachers kept saying, go back and sit, you know, just go back and sit, it'll take care of itself. And it didn't, it didn't work. So then I went into psychotherapy while I was still a monk. I worked with one of my students, actually. We did a lot of kind of bioenergetic kind of really intense kinds of stuff. And I thought, wait a second, you know, this meditation stuff, this isn't sufficient, mm. you know. And that was so-called preparation. It wasn't doing it for me. So then I went into therapy and I did a lot of that. 
before I met Jean Klein. I'd already been in therapy for a number of years. So I think we find our way the way we find our way. You know, we kind of stumble along, you know, and do what we need to do. And yeah. it works itself out in the end. I, fortunately, now we live in a world in, in the West, in the United States, where there are a lot of resources that you can draw on, unlike maybe in ancient India or, uh, you know, contemporary Japan or places like that. So uh, I think there's a lot uh, available to work yeah. with this stuff. Well, that's good. And the reason I bring it up is that I do run into a lot of people who have had that experience that um, either they go through a lot of stuff and it's really intense and then they, they eventually have an awakening or maybe they kind of slip right through somehow and have an awakening and, and then right. all, all hell breaks loose. You know? All hell breaks loose. All <laughs> loose. Well, one of, the, uh, one of my, uh, my teacher, my Zumi Roshi was one of my teachers at the Zen Center of Los Angeles and one of his uh, Dharma brothers, uh, Kohen Yamada Roshi, used to say, uh, Zen is for people in excellent mental health, mm -hmm. he said. Which, uh, you know, I think had a lot of truth to it, although, you know, uh, when you sign up, you don't take a, uh, a mental health test. Uh, you just start, you know, you start, you start doing it. Um, an another one that I actually experienced toward the end of my tenure as a monk, I went to this conference this guy named Jack Engler was there, and one of the things he said was that you have to be somebody before you can be nobody, ah. which has become a kind of popular meme within the Buddhist world, mm -hmm. uh, which is saying much the same thing, although he was specifically talking about people who didn't have a well-established sense of self in the ordinary, everyday way. You know, they couldn't function in the world. You need to be somebody in a, in a functional way before you can discover your true nature as nobody. Uh, I think there's some truth to that. I, I would critique it. I don't entirely agree with it, but I think there's a kernel of truth there. I think there is too. I was just exchanging emails with a, a, fellow, a friend of mine named Timothy Conway, who you may or may not know who... Um, I know Tim. You know, know Tim? Tim? And yeah. he was kind of um, telling me about some examples of neo Advaita teachers whose style is to kind of beat down the personality and obliterate it, you know, and, and that a friend of his had actually become, you know, really psychologically disturbed and un, un, unbalanced as a result of exposure to that. And th there's another fellow whom you may know, Scott Kilby, who wants to have a whole conversation with me about this at some point, but he says people come to him all the time who seem to be casualties of the, 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 the current non-dual scene, you know, and he feels that there hadn't been enough kind of psychological personal integrity established before they embarked on the quest of dismantling it you know <laughs> dismantling well, the ego yeah i would uh, there's a lot that one can say about that I, I think number one in the psychology world in psychotherapy you're taught to honor resistance uh -huh. and i think it's really important to honor the barriers and the blockages that seem so called to get in the way uh i think beating them down and trying to cut through them with a uh, a sharp sword is contraindicated. I think it can be dangerous. Mm. I think I think ultimately we have to bring compassion to this whole process, and that's really what I recommend. That yeah. whatever so-called ego is, uh, you know, we need to again welcome that as well. We need to embrace the ego, even. You know, I I think really there's a misunderstanding about what awakening is in the sense that. Awakening is not about transcending ego necessarily. I think awakening is about becoming intimate, completely intimate with what is, including our own psychology. Mm -hmm. So that there's really a compassionate embrace of everything about ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. I think there's a tendency in spirituality to want to push it away, to try to cut it out, to eliminate it, to transcend it, which I think is really um, misguided and can be dangerous actually. Yeah. Uh, because love doesn't work that way. It simply doesn't. Yeah, an awakening is a process of love. Nice. A friend of mine is fond, when people say to him, I am not a person, he, his response is, of course you're a person. You're just, you're just not only a person, you know? There's, there's, right. there's much more to what you are, but you, know, you don't kind of negate or eliminate that part of yourself. It's because you couldn't function without it. And, and it'll come back to bite you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> If you say something like that, it'll prove itself very quickly to be untrue. <laughs> yeah, you as, as we've seen with spiritual teachers who've acted out in various ways because they haven't acknowledged their own personal uh, issues. 
you know? Yeah, exactly. I, I love that part in your book where you mentioned the spiritual teachers who would, you know, fly into rages at their students or, or get into sexual things or embezzle money. And I can think of examples. You, you really hit the main three bases on... <laughs> <laughs> money, sex, and power, right? Yeah, they, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing I find interesting, though, hearkening uh, back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, you know, you, you mentioned that, well, first, one little wrap-up point on all this. I, I used to be in the TM movement, and, and you mentioned that in Zen they didn't have, like, an entry exam or something. You could just come in and get involved in it. But actually, in the TM movement, if you wanted to go on a long course, they looked carefully at, you know, your psychological health and whether you had had any issues or, you know, had been involved in some kind of counseling. And I think it was, it, unfortunately, it had the opposite effect in, in many cases of making people afraid to seek counseling when they needed it. And, uh, and that had its backlash. But uh, there was at least some attempt to screen people a bit before they went into intensive spiritual practice because there were casualties, certainly. And, I've seen, and there have been casualties in every spiritual movement when people yes. re really get cooking without adequate um, screening or I preparation. I think that's changed. I think that's changed, actually, in Zen. I think now many centers require that you fill, fill out a, uh, a, a psychological profile. Good. Uh, and indicate whether you've had been in therapy, whether you've had uh, you know uh, mental illness to the point that you had to be hospitalized, things like that, mm. uh, so that people are aware of this issue. Uh, it's changed since I practiced. I mean, that was you know, 25, yeah. 30 years ago. Yeah. And it's probably changed because of what they ended up experiencing with people who had had, you know, some. Right. Of, yeah. Right. There's probably some casualty cases. Um, mm. Another thing I want to jump back to as you were saying that maybe your Zen practice and all hadn't really been adequate preparation for your awakening, but I find that interesting phenomenon with you, with Adya, with other people, where, you know, they did a lot of intense spiritual practice and they don't consider themselves to have been very good at it. You know, Adya is always saying <laughs> what a lousy meditator he was, <laughs> you know, how he struggled and strained. But at a certain point, you know, both in his case and yours, when, when you let go, somehow or other bingo you know, there was this awakening and i wonder whether that awakening would have occurred had you not been struggling and straining for 10 years before letting go yeah, of course we can't really know that I, I i think that it really it did help i mean i can't deny that for some reason you know it developed an ability to be present because i was very good i would say i was a failed meditator in the sense that it didn't wake me up you know like aja right. uh, i hit i hit a wall i i started feeling like everything was very dry and uh, you know nothing was moving inside of me. But at the same time, I developed the capacity to be really present for my sensate experience. Mm. And I'd been a really, um, you know, uh, an academic and intellectual. So sitting for years and years, just being aware of my breathing, well, I think was a very helpful practice for mm. me. Uh, you know, so it shifted uh, that ability to be present which I think was a great, uh, a great gift. Yeah. But ultimately, the sense of, you know, striving and struggle, something had to cut through that. Yeah, yeah, you had to relax that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You've probably heard that saying that um, enlightenment may be an accident, but spiritual practice makes you accident prone. Exactly, I use it, I use it uh, often. Yeah. And when I talk about, when I teach, you know, that what I say is there are really two prongs to this approach, resting and inquiring. Mm -hmm. So sitting quietly is resting, right? I mean, ultimately, it's resting as awareness. Um, but even if it's just resting and being open and being present, you know, even if we're, there's a sense of some doing, still it's resting. You know, it's not efforting. It's not struggling. Uh, I really emphasize that. Yeah. I sometimes have used the example of a, like a pan of water, let, let's say, that has little waves in it, and you want to stop the waves. If you start pushing on the waves with your hands, you know, you're only going to create more waves. So you just have right. to have to kind of let the pan settle, and then you won't have the waves. Yeah, that's the still forest pool that's yeah. often talked about mm. in the Buddhist tradition. You know, you don't try to calm the pool; you just let it settle by itself. And when it settles, you can see down to the bottom. I mean, that's the classic metaphor. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, on this point of settling by itself, it would stand to reason that if given the opportunity, the mind would want to do that. You know, I mean, pure consciousness or pure awareness or one's natural state or whatever is uh, 
the word ananda is often associated with it, bliss, you know. And so the mind is naturally attracted toward bliss if it can find it. So it would seem that just sort of being more gentle and natural and effortless about this whole thing would be more conducive to the mind moving in that direction than, well, it's like, you know, if you want to hold a dog at your door, you can chain it and the dog will be struggling and straining, or you can put food there and then the dog will just be there with the food. Right, exactly. Uh, although I would say that uh, the mind, it, it depends on what you mean by mind. Mm. If by mind you mean ego or monkey mind, as it's often called, I don't think the mind really gravitates towards stillness. <laughs> I, think the, I think it's addicted to activity. Yes. But I think, I think awareness, consciousness itself, is drawn back into itself, into the stillness of its, of its true nature. Uh, the mind itself will follow consciousness and come to rest in that way. But the mind, the monkey mind, seems to like to be constantly moving. You know? Well, that's an interesting distinction that you just drew between consciousness and, and it's almost seemed like it was between consciousness and consciousness, that it, like an active phase of consciousness being drawn back to stillness, back to its true nature. Um, right. And then you distinguish that active phase of consciousness from mind. So that, that confuses me a little bit. And it reminds me of that second verse in Yoga Sutras, you know, um, yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind, yoga shitta vritti naroda. So what were you actually saying there just then? Well, in the, in the Zen tradition, we talk about big mind and small mind. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't use those terms anymore. But small mind is the ego mind. You know, it's thought. It's the activity of thought mm -hmm. that's constantly churning, right? You don't have to try to calm that in order to come into stillness, right? There's a, in fact, you can find stillness in the, in the midst of an active mind, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And so there's a sense in which uh, awareness or consciousness comes to rest in itself. Mind as conscious, you know, as thought, as ego mind, as monkey mind, may continue. It doesn't have to stop for uh, stillness to... Uh, be fully experienced, actually. I mean, it'll tend to stop, but it doesn't have to stop. Because this is where people get uh, kind of, um, how shall I say, misguided or confused. They think they have to calm the mind. Right. You know, that's not necessary. You don't try to calm the mind. <laughs> Again, it's like trying to still the pool. Mm -hmm. You just allow yourself to rest uh, as awareness, and the mind will come naturally to rest. Yeah, the mind fo follows suit. Good. Yeah, exactly. But not, not necessarily right, right away. No. It may, may take a while. may take decades <laughs> to get to the, the degree of calmness that's possible. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It may take decades. So that's what I meant. Okay. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, you were in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, and there was a big hurricane there recently, and you had a, a number of days of chaos and then waiting, trying to get a flight out of there. You managed to get a flight out to Texas or someplace. And, and so there's an example of a very tumultuous situation. Now, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I bet you you experienced that in the midst of all that tumult, there was a deep silence that was untouched by all the craziness. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, it was amazing. Uh, I, it was it was wonderful to see. Uh, you know, I felt very grateful uh -huh. that there was so much peace. You know, it was just a matter of doing the next thing. You know? Yeah, as, uh, uh, as our friend Suzanne Siegel doing the next obvious thing, right? Doing the, yeah, they're doing the next obvious thing. Yeah. But well, it's interesting you say chaos because isn't life always chaos in the in the biggest sense a, a mystery unfolding? Right? Yeah. Sometimes it seems more chaotic than other times, but it's always chaos. You know, chaos is not a bad thing. Yeah, yeah I, I heard, I was, was it you I was listening to? Somebody I was listening to that quoted the Tao Te Ching in saying that make all things orderly before they arise. Was that you? No. It, it's no, a beautiful no. verse because, I mean, at that level of silence we're talking about, it's, it's beyond chaos. It's a state of perfect orderliness and coherence. And, That's right. And if you can kind of sit yourself there, and uh, then, as then as things arise, they they tend to arise in a more coherent way. I mean, even though they may appear chaotic, it's like you know how everybody says in spiritual circles, "Well, everything is perfect just as it is." And then people, other people say, oh, "It doesn't look perfect to me. There's all this suffering, all this crazy stuff going on." But um, if uh, if you have that perspective from the field of of your your natural state, pure awareness then 
you are able to see the perfection inherent in everything. You see the orderliness, the perfection, the beauty inherent in what others perceive as chaos. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's why, that's why I venture to use the word chaos, because it's perfect in its imperfection. Yeah. You know, I mean, we talk about perfection. It's not perfection as opposed to imperfection. It's perfect in the sense that it couldn't be otherwise. You yeah. know. And in terms of the actual physical phenomena, physics, physical phenomena, a physicist would tell you that, you know, every single little thing that happens is happening in complete accord with laws of nature. You know, that nothing is capricious or arbitrary or, or you know, out of accord with very orderly natural laws that, that govern it. That's true. Uh, uh, but of course, we don't need to understand those natural laws to, to uh, appreciate the innate perfection because you know really the, the way we really know that is because consciousness is perceiving itself you know that which is perceiving and that which is perceived are one and the same how could it be perceived as imperfect or uh, chaotic in the, in the negative sense mm. it's it just is what it is <laughs> that's all that's that's all we can say in the end right Mm. It just is, is what it is, yeah? Yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to start looking at my notes here a little bit. I took a bunch of notes while I was reading your book. Um, of course. One point you made, uh, some of these are like seed thoughts, which we can leapfrog off of. Um, spacious awareness versus detached observing. Um, what were you saying about that in your book? Spacious awareness versus detached observing. Well, I think there's a tendency for people to, uh, particularly when they do mindfulness, mm -hmm. but often in any kind of spiritual uh, work, particularly the uh, non-dual traditions of getting caught in the witness, mm. you know, uh, being this detached, dry, kind of disengaged witness and getting stuck there, you know? And uh, like I said uh, earlier, it's really more about, about intimacy <laughs> with what is, which is in the detached witness is separate. And so it just perpetuates a sense of separation, subject-object split again. Whereas um, true awakening is about being intimate with what is. So spacious awareness is more like, and again, this is something you can experience energetically. I think it's something to really explore energetically. You know, are you feeling yourself as being distant and separate? Uh, you know, we all know those people who say, oh, well, I'm awakened and, you know, they, uh, they seem to be very distant. You know, they, they don't seem to have their heart in the game, you know, they don't seem to be engaged in life, right? Mm -hmm. So spacious awareness is more open, all-inclusive, and it has a kind of warm quality to it. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah Shins and Young mentioned something about cer certain practices seeming to make people kind of zombie-like. There you uh, go. You know, and exactly. last week I was actually, I was interviewing Kenneth Folk, I don't know if you know him, but um, we were talking about witnessing. And he actually said, oh, I can witness any time. And he got in, he kind of went into this state where he was like, the, he actually put his hands up as if I'm, I'm back, I'm witnessing, and he, his, his whole tone of voice changed. And, you know, just as we were saying earlier how mindfulness might actually be a symptom of the awakened state and not meant as a, uh, a method for achieving it, I'm wondering whether there's been a misunderstanding of this whole witnessing thing where people have turned it into something that they try to do rather than something they are. In other words, you, know, you and I were just talking about perfect silence in the midst of chaos. Well, if you're living that, then there's a sense of witnessing. I mean, all this whole hell's breaking loose and yet I'm just silent as a, you know, as a still pond and, 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 and there's no conflict there. Um, and yet, but that's, that's a far cry from trying to evoke some mood of being detached from everything and having that change the way you behave and, and interact with people, wouldn't you say? Uh, yes, yes. And, and also, I would also say that even the witness you describe in, in, in its most, um, let's say, well-developed form is still just a stage. Yes, yes. Because ultimately, even that witness has to uh, drop away, mm -hmm. you know. And that's what, again, what I mean by intimacy. Uh, often, th the way awakening goes for people is that there's first an awakening into the witness. Mm -hmm. There's an awakening out of the personality, 
out of the identification with the body mind into this uh, witnessing place, which is kind of detached. Yeah. This is, it's a helpful state uh, and a, a stage in one's unfolding, right? But you don't want to get stuck there. Right. And again, you move ultimately into the realization that there's no separation between the witness and that which is witnessed. The, the problem is getting stuck in the witness, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. Um, and the, the witness, the type of witness... It's, it's just... a state. It's a state. Uh, let me just say, a witness is a state. Mm -hmm. For most people, when you're in the witness, it's a state. Just like your friend said, or the person you were interviewing, you can go in and out of the witnessing state, you see. Any state, though, comes and goes. Your natural state is actually not a state. It's the ground of being. It's consciousness itself. Yeah. It doesn't come and go. So anything that comes and goes, including witnessing, is just a state. Well, right now, you and I are in the waking state, right? And yeah. in a certain number of hours, we'll be in the sleeping state. And then after a while, we'll be in the dreaming state. And each of these states of consciousness, which actually have their Sanskrit equivalents, are understood by physiologists as being as distinct physiologically as they are experientially. Um, so the kind of witnessing I'm talking about would be a state, if you want to call, like it, a, if you want to call it a state, that, yeah, like waking, dreaming, and sleeping, as unique from each of those three as they are from each other, but actually one that can be lived along with those three. Uh, and, right. and so may, are you with me there in terms of that statement? I am. Well, there's a fourth state, which is called Turiya. Turiya, right. Which is your natural state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't think that's just the witness. I think that's, uh, again, um, it's not the witness the way we're talking about it. I think it's the ground of being. Yes. Uh, it's a subtle distinction, but I think it's an important one. You know, people want to get stuck in the witness. <laughs> you know, they become very attached to the witness. They go around with this kind of detached, kind of pulled back sort of energy, which is constantly, and it's very safe in a certain way. Uh, it's very dry, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a, how shall I say, it's a pitfall. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. And I wouldn't actually, I don't think that deserves the term witnessing. I think it's a mood that they've inculcated and perhaps inculcated so deeply that they're in it all the time. Uh, and, but the kind of, the, this Turiya you're talking about, um, you know, that's, that's the, the natural state, the ground of being. Uh, what I would, th witnessing as I would think the term should refer to would, would be just having that Turiya spontaneously maintained throughout waking, dreaming, and sleeping uh, without evoking or holding on to any kind of attitude or mood or anything else. Just as natural as breathing or, or the beating of your heart, it's just lived once it's established sufficiently. Beautiful. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. And but as you say, even that is a stage, right? That's not going to be the end game. Which? Turiya? Yeah. That, maintaining Turiya throughout waking, dreaming and sleeping, there is more yet to come. Well, again, there, there's, it's not a matter of maintaining, though. Well, but spontaneously. Got to be careful of the words. I'm not talking about any effort to maintain. Right. Like right now, you and I aren't trying to maintain our heartbeat or maintain our waking, our wakefulness in terms of being conscious and talking to each other. It's just kind of a given that just keeps on happening. Without our, we, we don't become less awake by forgetting to remain awake, nor to become more awake. But, you know, it's just, it is the way we are, right? But, but in, in what way can we say we're maintaining it then? We're not maintaining our breathing. It's being maintained. It is it's being maintained. Yeah. It's continuing. Yeah. Right. Okay. So it's kind of a fine point in the terminology, but I, okay. It, that's what I'm trying to allude to. That that wit witnessing that really deserves the term is a natural state that doesn't take any effort to maintain. Either it it is or it isn't, depending upon how well established the fourth state is. Uh, yeah, but ultimately, witnessing realizes itself to be one with what's witnessed. Exactly. As long as, okay. Yeah, right. I'm with okay. you. We're good. <laughs> yeah, so it would be a, it, it itself, even though it's natural and, and, and spontaneous once it's established, is not the end of the show. There's going to right. be a, a further maturation into realizing that right. it's one with what's witnessed. Yeah, which yeah. means that the witness drops away. Because, right. right. yeah. So, so in that sense, there's no more witness. Right. You see, you know, so that, so the word witness then becomes unnecessary because yeah. there's ju just life living itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good.
Um, just kind of want to make sure we're on the same page. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Good, good. Yeah. Enjoy the conversation. Okay. Um, all right, another little seed point from my notes in reading your book. Mindfulness to avoid or suppress emotions. I think we've kind of touched upon that, but might might not hurt to touch upon it once again. Mindfulness, how it suppresses emotions? Yeah, how people can use mindfulness as a tool to kind of stuff everything. Absolutely. Or witnessing. For that or matter. witnessing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, uh, witnessing is a great way to avoid. You hang out in the witness. You avoid all feelings. Mm. Who, me? I don't have any anger. You know, <laughs> you, know the com you know the comedian Stephen Wright? He's, no, I don't. Yeah, he's really funny. Very droll, deadpan sort of comedian. He, he says, broke up with my girlfriend. I wasn't really into meditation, and she really wasn't into being alive. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. It can definitely go that way. So uh, Dogen, for example, said uh, Zazen is dancing on the heads of devils. What That's how we that? did. Uh, well, what he, I think he meant by that was that, you know, you do Zazen and you're dancing on the heads of devils. In other words, you do Zazen, you maintain a kind of meditative focus, mm -hmm. uh, mindfulness, you could call it. Mm -hmm. But un underneath the surface are all these feelings that are roiling around mm -hmm. and are not being acknowledged. And by maintaining a certain state, mindfulness, you can be very subtly, but very effectively, uh, suppressing these emotions, which then don't get realized. Huh. Now, I think uh, a good mindfulness teacher will uh, guide you to avoid that. But I think it's a definite pitfall in the practice of mindfulness or Advaita witnessing, right? So that was Dogen that said that? Yeah, interesting. Isn't that so a was he advocating that or, or critiquing? I mindfulness? don't know. I, I think actually uh, he was advocating it. And that's why I find it fascinating, yeah, because I, I think it, 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 it reveals a flaw in, in the whole Zen approach. Hmm. I think in a certain way, Zen, you see, Zen as it developed, and this is a, you know, a little side, side road here, but Zen as it developed was very closely uh, allied with the uh, samurai tradition uh -huh. and, and with the martial arts. And in those traditions, of course, you, you, you had to maintain what they called heiki, which is like absolute calm equanimity without so you had to suppress the emotions mm. so I, I think Zen were actually developed simultaneously with this need to suppress emotions which of course is very Japanese excuse my Japanese my Japanese friends because excuse me but it's very it's very Japanese huh. uh, so I think there's that risk um, yeah but you're gonna be playing whack-a-mole yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah exactly yeah, which is which is why I left the monastery finally because I had all kinds of feelings getting stirred up by the psychotherapy I was doing. I was living with some people, and uh, you know they were telling me I wasn't so cool after all, and you know, and all these things. And I was dealing with all kinds of feelings, and you know, meditation was kept pushing them down. I said, no, I better work with them. Huh. You know, yeah. You're probably more aware of this than I am, but uh, it really seems to me that there's a trend these days for people to address this issue that we're discussing here and you know they're tired of playing whack-a-mole they're tired of trying to hold five basketballs underwater at the same time you know the, to use the mix metaphors the, and they're realizing that if you really want an integrated stable full awakening all this everything's going to have to be dealt with and and you know in one way or another which is why i went to school psychotherapy to right become a psychotherapist it, it was uh initially the intention was to learn psychology mm -hmm. so I could be a better, better Zen teacher. Mm. It wasn't to become a psychotherapist. And also, it was so I could learn more about my own psyche so that I wasn't dealing with all these feelings and, you know, they're getting stirred up. And I knew how to deal with them. And I could uh, be more skillful because I saw teachers who were not skillful, mm -hmm. who were alcoholics, who were philanderers, you know, who were sexual predators. I saw all of that right. in, in my time and I realized I didn't want to do that. I couldn't do that. And then I ended, ended up becoming a psychotherapist. So I absolutely agree with you that like we talked about earlier, you know, you either before or after awakening, you're going to have to deal with these uh, issues. So how's that been going for you, both personally and as a psychotherapist? I mean, has it been a smooth, that's smooth is the wrong word, why should it be smooth? <laughs> Has it been successful for you to kind of 
as a psychotherapist and as a student of it to process what you've needed to process and how has that enriched your awakening or your realization and then maybe we can even talk about you know some of the people that you work with and how it how it has enriched sure. theirs and and just as a final addendum to this question are you seeing a kind of a new quality of awakening or realization in people who are either your patients or who have gone through this kind of uh, necessary dealing with buried stuff that is not seen in perhaps even in ancient traditions or in contemporary versions of ancient traditions yeah great uh, questions um, you may have to remind me of the ones that I forget but I'll, I'll address the first one I mean I, I bow to the years of psychotherapy that I did mm -hmm. uh, I do something called EMDR which is a trauma release technique and I did that for a year and a half uh, and I cried uh, pretty much nonstop through it, you know. Mm. Uh, after your so, awakening. Uh, after my awakening. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, uh, and then I had subsequent awakenings, kind of deepenings of your original awakening uh, as the result. In fact, one of my most profound awakenings happened um, on the mat in a bioenergetics session. I mean, <laughs> it was really very, very profound. I don't think my, my therapist realized what, what was going on, but. Uh, uh, so uh, they worked hand in hand, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, you know, occasionally I'll get I'll get hooked in. Uh, you know, I had significant trauma as a child, so occasionally I'll get hooked in. You know, fear will come up, and I won't know what's going on, and I'll have to just process the fear. But uh, you know, it, it's helped enormously in that regard. And, and I do find in working with people, you know, there have been questions at times by spiritual teachers and. Do they work hand in hand or they work across purposes, therapy and meditation or spiritual awakening? And in my experience, they, with the right view, they work hand in hand because the more that we free up the, uh, the contractions, the uh, core beliefs, the core stories, the more we see through those and free them up, the more uh, possibility there is to awaken beyond them. And the more there is awakening, the more those uh, core stories and, and belief systems and contractions get seen through. So they work hand in hand, mm -hmm. in my experience with, uh, with people, powerfully. And in fact, the EMDR is a, a great resource. I, I use this with many of the people that I work with. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes I like to think of awakening or, con or you know, on vast, vastness of awareness as a kind of a, a wonderful solvent which can, you know, like if you, to use an yeah. example, if you take some handful of mud and throw it in a little glass of water, the, the water is totally muddy, but if you throw it in an ocean, then phew, it just gets dissolved. So it's a real, ad That's you, right. you know, this working hand in hand, as you say, it's a real advantage to have that foundation. Yeah, yeah the most therapeutic thing you can do in, in a way is simply to rest as awareness, to rest in your natural state, what I call awakened awareness in the book Beyond Mindfulness, to rest as that, and then everything that arises is what they call in Tibetan tradition, self-liberated. Mm. Things arise and they release, they arise and they release. There's no attachment, there's no hooking in, there's no engagement, right? Mm. But of course, you know, you know, how much can we do that? How much do we do that? That's why the psychotherapy can help free that up, which allows us to rest more, which allows us to free up more, which, so they work hand in hand in a beautiful way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you're down in Mexico. Do you, like most of your patients or clients, whatever you call them, deal with you over Skype or something? Yeah, phone, phone and Skype. Phone and yeah. Skype, yeah. And that doesn't really ha hamper or hinder your effectiveness? Not in my experience. I've had some really powerful sessions with people over the phone, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of uh, processing trauma, as good as I've had face to face. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I will say as an aside, Working on the phone in a certain way has an advantage to working in an office because it bypasses the formality mm. of the face-to-face -face contact. People are used to talking to their friends on the phone, yeah. you know, and sharing their most intimate details. Mm -hmm. And so people just pick up the phone and it's like we're right there, you know. Yeah. It's very <laughs> intimate, very intimate. Yeah. And so the second part of my question was about, you know, which I think you've answered partially, but maybe you can address more fully, is are you, do you feel like there might be a kind of a, and Andrew Cohen used to talk about this, the fact that spirituality itself is evolving as we as a culture evolve and we're actually breaking fresh ground that hadn't perhaps been broken by uh, more traditional 
teachers and experiencers of 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 years ago. Do you feel that this topic we're on right now about resolving all your psychological <laughs> stuff is resulting, are you seeing it result in the emergence of a quality of awakening in, in various people that might be sort of a new um, template or a new, uh, a new standard uh, that you know, doesn't really have an historical precedent? You know, I don't feel like I have a large enough sample to make, <laughs> draw any conclusions. Um, and as far as a new kind of awakening, I'm, I, I think that's maybe our uh, tendency to want to see what we're doing is special. Yeah, you be. know, in, in our historical period, wow, it's new and better than ever, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can believe that if you'd like. But uh, I think awakening to our true nature is the same as it's always been. It does seem to be that more and more people uh, have access to it, uh, perhaps because there are so many teachers and teachings. Uh, I think that has advantages and disadvantages. I, I think it can get confusing if people come to me or reading this book and that book and comparing and contrasting and getting completely lost. But at the, at the same time, there's a lot of input from many different sides telling us you know, that uh, who you really are is not who you think you are and this is who you really are and pointing directly. it's. There's a, a lot of pointers available, yeah. right? So it's, it's great. I think one thing I had in the back of my mind when I asked that question is, you know, you and I both have seen examples of teachers who have come maybe from the East, uh, maybe some already in the West, who seem to be off the charts in terms of consciousness, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of their realization is radiated like a lighthouse. Uh, but who really had some issues, um, you know, with regard, to, <laughs> as evidenced by the types of behaviors you mentioned earlier. And so, you know, if if you could have people who radiated, who who were that profoundly, you know, absorbed and immersed and, and radiating being, and yet had resolved those issues, wouldn't you wouldn't you perhaps have an even sort of more uh, ideal, <laughs> if you could say, uh, type of realization than, than someone who's, you know, just really grounded in their true nature, but somehow has all these blind spots and behavioral weirdness. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. I agree. It sounds like a, a beautiful ideal, mm -hmm. as you said, and something to aspire to. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just let, let's just remember that it's not about perfecting the individual. You know, yeah. it's not become it's not about becoming a perfect person. It's becoming it's about becoming a how, how should we say, a, as clear and unobstructed a vehicle for consciousness to move through, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think there's a tendency for people to want to become an enlightened person, mm -hmm. you know? So I just want to, you know, throw that out as a caveat. Sure. But what you just said, as clear and unobstructed a vehicle for consciousness to move through, that, you know, you're not going to be perfect, uh, but you're kind of alluding to moving in the direction of perfection, you know, you're, you're like, well, you, you're, you're an, a clean mirror as opposed to a, one that's all covered with schmutz, you know, and that's not going to reflect right. the sun very well. Right. Uh, but it, it, there's some subtle distinctions here, because one thing is that the person, you're not trying to change the personality. You're not trying to necessarily change the unique uh, idiosyncratic nature of this particular one here, you know. Right. Uh, and, and there can be a tendency to want to iron out all the you know, the, 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 the creases and, and get everything perfect, you know. But what it is about is um, wherever truth wants to move, uh, if there's a blockage, if there's some way in which it's not happening, then you can investigate that, right? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's not about a self-improvement project. I just want to make, yeah. Sure. But uh, just to continue the discussion. Um, so, yeah, you know, yeah. Stephen Bodian has a personality, as does Rick Archer, and, and there are certain aspects of our personalities that we're always going to have, no matter how bloody yeah. enlightened we become. <laughs> it's always going to be, we, are, we, are, we, are, we have our uniquenesses. And yet, you know, I don't know about you, but I definitely have aspects that probably need re resolution or resolving or, you know, cleaning out or whatever that would enable me to be a, a more perfect. How do you know that? How do you know that? Well, because over the years, uh, I've improved, you know, in, in many respects. And so there's a trend that I observe, and it's made me, it's allowed me to be a more perfect reflector, whatever terms you just used a minute ago. But how did you know that you, these are areas you needed to work on? I didn't. I mean, unlike you, I never have done therapy, but just somehow through just over time, practice, spiritual maturation, 
there has been, I hope anyway, maybe, maybe my wife would tell you otherwise, but there's been an improvement in, in many ways. And, and I, I, I was going to, I was going to point to your wife. See, I think, yeah. I think it's, I think your wife is, uh, your she, wife she is just stuck her head in the door and said, I could use some therapy. Yeah, yeah, really. really. <laughs> maybe I should call so you. <laughs> I think she's the reason. See, she's the reason because you keep bumping up against her uh -huh. and, and you keep bumping up against your, you know, your friends, or maybe you have kids, your kids or whatever it is. Life is a great teacher in that yes, regard. Yes, yes. Yeah. Wherever we bump up against life and, and, you know, then we feel that, so, so that's how we learn, you know, mm -hmm. where we're obstructing is life gives us feedback. Yeah. You're a great teacher. Yeah. I yeah. interviewed a lady a few weeks ago and the title of her book was, What's in the Way is the Way. <laughs> great. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And then people are fond of saying the world is my guru, you know, that there's this, Absolutely. there's a kind of an intelligence that's governing things that gives us exactly what we need. I agree. Life yeah. is the teacher. Yeah. yeah. Totally. All right. So, I mean, but you are a professional psychotherapist. So on, on the one hand, you would acknowledge that there's certain aspects of people that aren't going to change. But on the other hand, the people come to you because they want to change or they want to rid themselves of habits or tendencies or right. repress stuff that's hanging them up. That's true. Suffering is the key. I mean, obviously, suffering, not pain, but suffering, mm -hmm. which generally means conflict, you know, inner conflict, being at war with ourselves, being at war with life, yeah. that kind of suffering, that's the indicator. But again, life reveals that, right? So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, here's a question for you related to that. Could an enlightened person suffer? And second part of the question is, would an enlightened person necessarily be a happy person? <laughs> Uh, I would say that an enlightened person is a happy person. Yeah. By definition. By definition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I put that on my website. Happiness is your natural state. I mean, happiness is your birthright. Yes. And, yes. The, and, by, and they wouldn't suffer. Uh, it, it depends on what you mean by suffering. Yeah. In terms, like, yeah, in ter in terms of conflict, uh, uh, you know, being at war with life. No. Right. no so physical pain, not. sure. but Physical but, pain, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so with regard to their being happy, uh, would you say that an enlightened person and, you know, enlightenment is such a loaded term, I hate to use it, but uh, you, know what we're, yeah. you know what we're referring to here, just for convenience sake, we'll use the term. Uh, could they experience depression, anger, um, jealousy, uh, you know, any of those kinds of emotions or would, would their sort of attunement to the natural state or living as that to pretty much um, negate or obviate any such negative emotions? I think, uh, well, depression is not an emotion. Depression is a sustained state of being, okay. uh, which is, let's just put depression out of the, the mix here. But in terms of sadness, grief, uh, you know, anger, jealousy, uh, I'm not so sure about jealousy. I think the, the pure anger, fear, uh, uh, sadness, uh, grief uh, can arise, I think, naturally. Yeah, your daughter uh, dies or something, or what exactly. if some guy runs off with your wife, you know, then maybe jealousy? Yeah, jealousy. Even around. an enlightened yeah, yeah. state. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, you know this whole notion of enlightened. I mean, fully enlightened. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there, 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 there are conversations, endless conversations about what that means. What that right? means, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I, certainly, I have emotions coming up. You know, am I an enlightened person? I don't know. I don't. I don't <laughs> worry, worry about that definition. You know. Yeah. Ordinarily, I don't use that term and. You know, it's just convenient to use it, but maybe awakened is better. But even that has a sort of a static, superlative connotation. You know, and um, I kind of like to think of awakening the way you described it earlier as a milestone, but not necessarily. I mean, it's an important milestone, but there's still going to be plenty of post-awakening growth, and maybe we yeah. need to reserve the term enlightenment for some final stage of development if there even is such a thing but i doubt that actually yeah yeah i think it's endless actually yeah. i think you know once you awaken the, the process of embodying and living it is endless and refining and deepening yeah. and it's an endless process that's what that's my experience so. yeah which means leads me to the whole discussion of why one would consider or continue to meditate after awakening um i mean ramana spent years in a cave after his awakening and i I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm told the Buddha meditated a couple hours a day the rest of his life uh, after his awakening. So would you say that they did that if they did because of the possibility of further refinement and embodiment and so on? Um, the, what would you say to that? 
I would say it's more likely that they're just drawn into the silence. Because of the, just the inherent uh, enjoyment of that, the, the restfulness, the, the, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I certainly find that. I find myself drawn, just it's almost like uh, being pulled mm -hmm. into, into the silence, you know? Yeah. And then there's activity, and then there's a pull back into the silence. Mm -hmm. It just seems to happen, right? That's so natural cycle. I yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't think it's something they intentionally do in order to, you know, for some reason, some end game. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, not, not like they're trying to get somewhere. But, um, right. But I wonder about this refinement thing, because it seems to me there's a, possibly a great range of potential for refinement post-awakening. You know, once the self is realized, great potential for refinement of the senses the emotions the you know the all, right. all sorts of things that we as an as an instrument <laughs> uh could become b better at and you know i think that's true and once we awaken i think we're sort of uh drawn to that inexorably you know it's like we're, we're really on this journey of uh complete you know we're committed <laughs> you know we're, we've signed up we drunk the kool-aid we're on our way you know to and uh, whatever's in the way of truth, you know, we, we're, we're wanting to investigate that. Um, you know, it seems to be the case. It's, you could say it's like a fire. Once it's burning, it starts consuming yeah. everything in its path, you know. And in a certain way, I think that's what the bodhisattva vow means. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, you could even say uh, that something else kind of takes over once awakening has happened and it's no longer the individual running the show and that, that something else is kind of a very powerful evolutionary force which remember peace pilgrim that that old woman who or she wasn't old when she started but she just walked around the united states for years in a pair of sneakers and a t-shirt and just kind of threw her, her life to the mercy of what whatever support she happened to get and everything worked out for her and she was really a saint and a very high level of aware, consciousness and she drew this graph of, uh, on her website or she, she there was no website in those days but she drew this graph about um her, you know, evolution and, and of spiritual evolution, and she kind of marked on the graph a certain point at which self-realization or awakening occurred. But then after that, it was kind of like a hockey stick thing where the graph really took off because she said, you're no longer in the way, you know, you're no, you're no longer running the show and interfering. And so the evolutionary process can work through you much more powerfully or efficiently than, than it was able to before. Right. Yeah, and that which is working through you is what you are. Mm -hmm. Here's one, um, notes from your book. Um, <laughs> being no one, someone, nothing and everything. Mm -hmm. This is kind of all at the same time. You know, there are people who say they're no one and, then, uh, and yet at the very same time, you know, you bang your shin on the, on the coffee table and whoa, that, that, happened, that seems to have happened to someone. All right, no, exactly. Uh, I, I call that the razor's edge, you know? It's like the, the edge where uh, nothing bursts into something, no one bursts into someone. You know, there's this kind of a, uh, you can almost feel it, you can almost sense it. There's an edge, this razor's edge, you know? And we're constantly on this razor's edge, you know? Knowing we're no one and yet appearing as someone. Wow, here it is again, someone, you know, life presenting itself mm -hmm. to this person. People wanting something from this person, wanting a response, wanting a affection, you know, wanting a, a communication, whatever it is. And how does that take place? You know, that's the razor's edge, you know. Mm. So we're constantly dancing on that edge, you know, and exploring that edge. That's, that's what it's like, you know. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, get dropped in a snowstorm in your underwear and, uh, you know, <laughs> someone is cold. <laughs> it's not, it's not the tree that's, that's right. cold. This, this body is cold and I, I'm kind of attached to it and it needs warmth. Right. <laughs> or have your wife get angry at you for something you didn't do or did do or, you know, and then what, you yeah. know, uh, you know, you feel it. We're saying, yeah, you feel it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. yeah. And yet, and, the, and if you don't feel it, as you said, you're dead, you're checked you know, out. as you're, uh, you're checked out. So, so, so how do you live in the world of feeling, of human emotion, of human connectedness and interrelatedness at the same time knowing that it's all just play, it's all just a dream? How, you know, what is that like? That's the dance, see? Mm -hmm. 
That's what we're here to do. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a form, right? Yeah. Otherwise, we'd be formless consciousness. Otherwise, There's obviously otherwise a reason why we... bother having a universe. That's right. Right. That's right. <laughs> so, how would you answer that question you just asked? How you live in the world of? Uh, there is no answer. You have to discover it. Mm. It's an ongoing discovery. Yeah. yeah. But on the one hand, you can get caught in identifying with the story and the person, and you know. Uh, what I want, what I don't want, and what I'm achieving and not achieving, or you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Or you can get caught in the witness, in being the absolute and, and being disengaged. So what is it like to be on that edge? There's no answer. It's, it's a dance. Mm -hmm. you know? like, like any dance, you can't say, this is how you do it. Find your way. Yeah. Yeah. There's, a, there's an Upanishad. I don't know if this is what it's alluding to, but it goes... Uh, into blinding darkness go they who worship ignorance, even to, into even greater darkness go they to, who worship knowledge. And I kind of think it pertains to this point of, you know, you can get totally stuck in the relative and it's blinding darkness, but you can also get totally stuck in the absolute and, you know, to the negation of the relative. And that's, that's perhaps in a way even a, a greater, right. greater darkness. And so what you're talking about here is, is in, incorporating the two within one life, within one awareness. And that's, there are a lot of passages in the Zen tradition that talk exactly about what you're talking about. Mm. Uh, because Zen is very much about the integration of form and emptiness. Um, you know, the tendency in the, uh, say, the non-dual traditions of India is to emphasize the absolute, you know, and to really de-emphasize the everyday, mm -hmm. you know, to, to lean toward the transcendent. Uh, but Zen is very much, which I bow to Zen for this, you know, is very much about the integration, the mm -hmm. ordinary, the everyday. Uh, and so I, I think I imbibed that. Chopping <laughs> my wood, carrying answer. water. Chopping wood, carrying water, yeah. you got it. Yeah. Huh. <clears throat> it's another quote I took from your book. Relaxation generally seems much more conducive to realization than tension and struggle. Exactly. Well, that's coming from my experience, right? Yeah. The years and years of pushing, you know, they used to go around in the Zendo with a stick, you know, hitting you, you know, with a break through the koan, break through the koan, you know, mm. you gotta, you gotta sit hard, you know, you gotta really sit hard, you gotta really push through. And it just made me a nervous wreck, I think, actually. Mm. Yeah. And which is then when I got to Jean, Jean Klein, you know, he finally said to me, um, you know, uh, the only point of meditation is, as I, you mentioned, to discover the meditator. That's it. Otherwise, it's just a habit. You know, it's a way of conditioning the mind. Uh, and, you know, you're not trying to condition the mind. You're trying to find the natural state, the unconditioned mind. Mm. So, yeah. Are you friends with Francis Lucille, who was a fe fellow student of Jean Klein? Yeah, we, we studied with Jean together. Mm -hmm. We were fellow students of Jean's, yeah. Yeah. He was quite a guy, John Klein. I mean, I never met him personally, of course, but um, he really seems to have had a, a very beautiful effect on a lot of people. Well, uh, my experience of Jean is that he taught more, at least for me, he taught more through the silence mm -hmm. than through the words. Although it was some words he had said that woke me up. But, uh, you know, that in, in that moment when I woke up, those words are going through my head. but. Uh, it was really the times that I felt the transmission the most deeply were in the silence. Mm -hmm. Had he been a student of Ramana Maharshi? Or where did he, what was his background? He uh, went to India, not even looking for a teacher, mm -hmm. particularly, and he discovered a, um, a, uh, a teacher who was a, um, a, a teacher at a Sanskrit college in mm -hmm. Bangalore, who was also an Advaita teacher. He was also, you know, unknown, not celebrated. And through his contact with him, who he spent three very intimate years with his teacher. And then after three years, he had his awakening, his profound awakening. And then his teacher told him to go back to Europe and teach. So, so he did. But he didn't teach with anyone uh, famous, although he did uh, spend time studying uh, Kashmir Shaivism with a one particular, someone he just came across. He also studied yoga with Krishnamacharya, who is the teacher of Iyengar. And um, 
he also uh, met and had a close relationship with Sri Atmananda Krishna Menon. Uh, and I think there was a very uh, a sense of real resonance there. Uh, so those were some other influences beside this uh, particular uh, teacher. Yeah. Interesting. Um, we alluded very briefly earlier to uh, Suzanne Siegel. I just, just want to mention who she was. She uh, wrote a great book called Collision with the Infinite. And I know you were a friend of hers. Um, I never quite met her, although she was in the TM movement for number of years and uh, then she eventually left and she was living in Paris, married, pregnant, had stopped meditating, was just getting on a bus one morning and all of a sudden, boom, this <laughs> this awakening, you know, and which completely freaked her out because she didn't have a context for it. She didn't understand what was happening to her and she, she kind of went through 10 years of terror uh, trying to figure out what was going on with her. Meanwhile, raising a daughter and getting a, a master's degree or a PhD or whatever she got. And then she eventually ran into to Jean Klein, who just put her at rest and made her, enabled her to realize that something good had happened, that it was a spiritual thing. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, there's an example how interesting. She spent all those years in TM, mm -hmm. and yet when she woke up, she didn't know what it was. Yeah. Fascinating, huh? It is, because I'm sure she had heard a thousand times a description of the sort of state that she had actually achieved, but her, con her concept or understanding of that description was so different from the actual experience when it happened that she didn't put two and two together. As was mine. Yeah. It wasn't what I expected. <laughs> yeah. it, never, it never is. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Well, um, is there anything else that I haven't finished reading your book? Your second book, and and uh, I'm sh and you've probably written other things. Is, is there anything that's important to you that we haven't covered in this conversation that you'd like to discuss before we conclude it? Well, one thing I've thought about, which is I think uh, you know helpful to talk about, is that um, after people wake up, I think there's a tendency to think, uh, and we've touched on this a little bit, but there's a tendency to think th that after you wake up things are just going to be blissful and groovy, you know, and everything's going to be fine. Right. And, and, and then if they're not, then to discredit your awakening, mm -hmm. that, that maybe that really wasn't a genuine awakening or, you know, I did something wrong or something. And I think it's really important, and that's what Wake Up Now goes into in, in a lot of detail, is I think uh, it's really important for people to realize that there's a, a path after awakening and that it often involves... Uh, a number of pitfalls post awakening. Mm. You know, one one of them is to discount your awakening. Another one is to identify with your awakening and think of yourself as this awakened person. You know, uh, you know. Another one is to get trapped in the transcendent, like we talked about the witnessing. Uh, you know, uh, so I think there are a number of. Another one is to get caught in the "I got it, I lost it" phase. Uh, phase. You know where gee, I had it, but now I lost it, and now I'm struggling to recreate it, and, mm. you know, all my a attempts to recreate that beautiful state that I had, you know, don't seem to get me anywhere. I mean, those kinds of things are pretty much par for the course. Um, so that's when I think it's really important to have a good teacher uh, to guide you. Awakenings can often be spontaneous, you know, but uh, after awakening, I think it could be really helpful to have someone to guide you through the Scylla and Charybdis, you know, the kind of the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, movement through between the rocks of the different uh, pitfalls, you know. Um, so I, I, that's what, one of the things I really I think is important to tell people. Yeah. Uh, I think there's some pre-awakening pitfalls that are important to touch upon too, perhaps, because uh, one thing I run into most commonly is people who've gotten excited about this whole non-duality thing and, and enlightenment, awakening and so on, but started to read a bunch of books and gained an intellectual or even an intuitive sense of, right. of what, it all, what it is and then mistake that intuitive or intellectual understanding for the, the full enchilada and, and then, you know, usually they're the ones that are most belligerent on the chat groups sort of pontificating with people about you know, the fact that there is no person and you know there are no levels and all this stuff but I think that's a pretty common pitfall I, I totally agree I'm glad you brought that up I, th I think that's one of the major pitfalls actually one of my uh, students introduced me to some uh, chat room I forget what it was called something like uh, 
I don't know, it was about breaking through and it was very aggressive. You know, was all it the Liberation youth, Unleashed? Yes, Liberation Unleashed. Right, yeah. I interviewed those I, ladies. Yeah. I thought, my gosh, this is not, I think this is counterproductive, you yeah. know. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I think it's very easy to get into this kind of intellectual understanding uh, and think you have it. Uh, but awakening, it's important to remember, is an actual experience. Generally, the experience of breaking through has a quality to it. Don't get caught by the experience or just try to stay there. But there's really something shifts, something dramatic and uh, radical shifts in your locus of identity. Mm -hmm. And until that's happened, you know, as my teacher Jean Klein used to say, you haven't left the garage, mm -hmm. you know? And I think it's really important, you know, and I think there are a lot of people who get the Advaita speak down, you know, they get all the jargon down and they can run through all the arguments really, really skillfully, mm -hmm. but they, they haven't realized it, you know. Yeah, I mean, I gave a good, pretty good rap on LSD in 1967, you know, I could keep a room spellbound <laughs> pontificating about you know, the levels right. and bardos and all this stuff, you know, but, you know, 47 years later, I feel like I'm still gaining greater clarity and you know in in, in right. a sense I'm, I'm you know still a spiritual neophyte there, there's a beautiful quote from Adyashanti let me just open it up here on my iPad it only take me a second um, one two three four cool. see the thing the thing about awakening mm -hmm. is is that it's completely humbling it's yeah. completely humiliating the ultimately awakening is about completely obliterating you know any separation so, uh, you know, it, it's working in, in, in that direction, yeah. you know, uh, it, you know, it, it works through love. I mean, it's ultimately about love, but it can be very uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, don't be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the quote from Aja. He said, even now with me, the mystery is just beginning, always, always still beginning. Beautiful. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. That's exactly how I feel. Exactly how I feel. And here's one from St. Teresa of Avila. She said, the feeling remains that God is on the journey, too. God is the journey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I mean, the, my understanding of, what, the, of that quote from her is that, you know, you can be right. God and there's still growth possible. You know, there's still something yet to discover. And well, because God is discovering through his creation. Yeah, yeah. You know, from that perspective, I don't believe in God as a, you know, as a creator and that sort of thing. But from that perspective, God is constantly revealing and discovering through creation. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's an endless process. Yeah. We're his little tendrils, his little villi that are sort of... <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> cool. All righty. Well, this has been a fun conversation. Anything else you want to throw in before we wrap it no, up? I think that's good, Rick. I've enjoyed it. Okay, great. Let me make a few concluding remarks. Um, so I've been speaking with Stephen Bodian. And I did pronounce your name right, right? Bodian? Absolutely. Okay, no. good. Because I heard some interview with... Uh, some other guy you did, and he pronounced it Bodian, but then he said Gene Klein, so I figured Bodian was the way to go. Yeah. Uh, so I've been speaking with Stephen, and uh, I'll be linking to his website, as always, from his page on batgap.com, uh, and his books and so on, his Amazon listings for his books, I'll be linking to those. Uh, so you can link, you can bounce over to his website and check out what he has to offer, and, uh, you know, in terms of courses, personal consultations, and retreats and the whole deal. Um, anything else you want to throw in there that you have on your site that people might want to know about? No, that's great. My, my books are listed as well. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and this uh, interview is part of an ongoing series, which I've been doing for about five years now and hope to do for many years to come. Um, you can see all the interviews that I have already done under the past interviews menu on batgap.com. They're categorized in various ways. There's a future interviews menu which lists the upcoming ones that have been scheduled. Uh, there are hundreds of people on the, uh, the list of potential interviewees, and so we try to prioritize those as best we can. Um, there's a donate button on the site. Um, this whole thing is possible because of the support of generous donors, and even small amounts, like $5 a month, which some people do, uh, make a difference if enough people do it. Um, there is a place to sign up and be notified by email each time a new interview is posted. You'll see that on the site. There's a, a link to um, being able to subscribe to the audio podcast in a variety of ways, iPhone, Android devices, and so on. So click on that link and choose the one which pertains to you. 
And there's some other stuff. If you click the About Us menu, there's, there's even a place where you can download the Batgap theme song as a ringtone. <laughs> so we keep coming up with ideas and trying to make this more and more useful resource for everybody. So uh, thank you very much for listening or watching. Um, thank you, Stephen. And uh, we'll see you all next week.